been intense uh, the last few days in uh, in London, uh, starting with a meeting in Dowdy Street with Amal and uh, uh, Keelan Gallagher, who's also here. Um, they lead our international team. And then moving on to the dinner last night with Bill and the uh, other awardees. This is an incredible room full of people who are fighters. I see them at every table. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, whew, I think the question that we've had to face, and we talked amongst ourselves about this, we talked at the trust conference, it's a question that, um, it's, a, it's a simple question. What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to sacrifice for truth? And I think this is the question all of us are asking for this time. Um, I've never really f felt this kind of urgency, uh, this moment, that you need to define that for yourself because these times will demand it from you, right? And for me, I first came face to face with this when uh, uh, Time Magazine, um, and it is really nice to see the fiance of Jamal Khashoggi here, for, er, you, because this is the third or fourth time that Jamal and I have been in this honored in the same place or awarded in the same place and that the guardians of truth there were four of us on on, on the time person of the year last year uh, the journalists murdered at the capitol gazette jamal this brutal murder that rippled through all of through the global community of journalists um, the reuters journalist that Amal um, helped release from Myanmar, from a Myanmar prison. They were in a prison then, and then I was the fourth one. And uh, actually, time didn't tell me about it, so when I first heard, I took the tweet, I heard about it from Twitter, and sent it to my social media team and asked if it was fake news. Um, and then CNN called, and I realized, oh my God, and I had a sinking feeling in my stomach because I realized that is this, this guardians of truth, is this what is demanded of journalists today? Do we have to give up so much to be a good journalist? Uh, in 2018, the Philippine government filed 11 cases against me and Rappler. That's almost a case a month. And um, I was, I had to post bail eight times. In order to be here, I've, posted more bail than Imelda Marcos, who's been convicted in uh, four different countries. Uh, I've done nothing wrong but to be a journalist. So what we lived through in Rappler really forced us to draw the line. Three years ago, we were fighting against impunity. We started doing investigative stories on impunity on two fronts. One is against a, a private company, Facebook, which was enabling the propaganda war, this three-part series we published in 2016 about the impact of Facebook's algorithms on democracy. The second was against our country, the Philippine government, which had begun a brutal drug war that human rights groups, our Philippine Commission on Human Rights puts the death toll at 27,000, at least 27,000 killed since July 2016. This has forced us to define who we are and how much we will sacrifice because you really don't know who you are until you're forced to fight for it, right? So many at the tables have fought for, have taken a position. Um, so I'm willing to give up some of my freedoms. Uh, I have to post bail, I have to post bond. I can't change my flight after the court approves it. Um, and it took Amal to tell me exactly how many years I could go to prison because the 11 cases were handled by different lawyers and they were passing through me. We don't have a chief corporate counsel. And uh, then I realized, oh my God, 63 years. Um, but I still have it way better than most people who are fighting this fight. Uh, 
Also at the launch of Trial Watch, Jason Rezaian, who was on the panel with me this afternoon, right? Uh, that was the first time, April last year was the first time I began to think I could actually go to jail. And then he gave me his book, which I read all in one chunk. And um, I tried to place myself, he was in jail for 544 days. And I tried to think, could I do this? Uh, is it okay? Can I, can I continue doing stories? Because you have to like be okay with, with 544 days. And I, my takeaway from his book was that in order to keep himself physically fit, he exercised. But the room was so small that in order to exercise, he walked around in a circle. And then after he was released, after 544 days, he was out in a mall in Germany and he walked around in a circle. <laughs> he, today on the panel, he said he still tries to stop himself from doing that. There are costs for, and this time will leave a mark on us. Um, and then of course there's Daphne. Daphne's sons, Paul and Matthew are here. Matthew and I were on a panel this afternoon. Um, Matthew described how he was in the house when the car bomb went off and that he has to pass through the driveway twice a day. Um, his mom did nothing but be a great investigative journalist to hold power to account. And Matthew was first on the scene while well, he ran out. And when he talked about it this afternoon, he, he, it's tough to go through that. He turned away, and then when he turned to me, that was probably the most emotional I'd ever gotten because I also remembered something he told me after I first got arrested. He said, Maria, you remind me of my mom. And it's kind of like the Time Magazine moment, right? As, what does that really mean? The fact that Paul and Matthew and the family are working with Keelan and to, to still f to fight for justice, to demand justice now gives me tremendous hope. Um, like the Magnitsky Act, it provides hope that all of our battles will converge and that we can hold power, great power to account, that we're not foolish. Because <laughs> we're not, right? We're not foolish. Every report on press freedom globally has dismal findings. Freedom House chronicles this downward spiral over more than a decade. Reporters Without Borders, she, uh, she was uh, the anchor for our panel this afternoon, shows how fear has increased because of authoritarian regimes and how they use technology to incite hate against journalists. The things that Daphne and her family went through four years before she was targeted mortally are the same things that are being used against us in the Philippines. Incite to hate, create an enemy of the people, use social media exponentially, and then have it come top down. We're not alone in this. Other journalists are facing this. And then Amal quoted the Committee to Protect Journalists, their 2019 Global Impunity Index, which says that Philippines had the most number of unsolved journalist killings. Press freedom is the foundation of every single freedom guaranteed in our democracies. So now more than ever, we know that information is power. Now more than ever, we need the rule of law. This is an existential moment, not just for journalism, but for democracies around the world. The battle for truth, the Time Magazine, the guardians of truth. The battle for truth is the battle. It is our battle. It's 
something we must win because technology acting as an accelerant makes a lie pounded a million times a fact. If you don't have facts, how can you have truth? Without truth, you can't have trust. Without these three, then we don't have democracy. That's the moment we're living through. So thank you, Bill, for this untiring work, the work of really one, a tragedy that inspired one man to pull a room full of people people that will ripple across time, that will give us more weapons to fight with, um, for recognizing also that the courage these times demand is impossible for one person alone. It's impossible for one journalist. It's something that we must collectively fight together. Journalists can't do this alone. So please, Ask yourselves again, ask your friends and family, what are you willing to sacrifice for the truth? What are you willing to sacrifice? Then please think about it and like Bill, do it. Because now is the time to act. Our battle cry in Rappler is hashtag hold the line, hashtag shine the light. We must demand accountability and I'm positive with the people in this room. We will do it together. Thank you.